today on Crested Butte is home. We have Irwin Brewing's Dave Nornis, and so this is obviously a really fun episode because we get to talk about all things brewing and all things beer, and um, I'm really excited that uh, that Dave was able to talk, and I'm excited that we have a great brewery here in Crested Butte these days. Uh, if you haven't had any yet, you can um, find them at a lot of restaurants in town, and you can also swing by the brewery and uh, pick up a growler, so go, go say hi to Dave and pick up a growler. My name is Frank Concello. My website is CrestedButteRealEstateAgent.com, and uh, I hope you enjoy the show. Please subscribe on Apple Podcasts or uh, the new Google Podcast, which was just released yesterday, which is exciting for Android users like myself, and I uh, hope you enjoy the show. Today on Crested Butte's Home, I am speaking with Dave Norness of Irwin Brewing. And uh, Dave, tell us a little bit about yourself. About myself? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was born in Minneapolis. Okay. And uh, I guess when I moved out to Fort Collins, Colorado, where I'd say I grew up. Um, went to kindergarten in Fort Collins, so almost a native. Almost native, yeah. yeah I feel pretty native. My father was a professor at Colorado State. What did he teach? He was in uh, anatomy and physiology. Okay. Some, some hard science. Yeah. And, um, yeah, they still live there in Fort Collins. I love that town. Yeah, it's and a good place. a pretty big beer town. As it is for sure. Know. Yeah. And how did you end up here in Crested Butte then? Um, well, I grew up, my dad loved skiing, so we grew up as skiers. Yeah. And um, skied mostly the northern mountains there, Steamboat, Winter Park. Um, I didn't get to Crested Butte until after I'd moved to Colorado Springs after college and started exploring southern mountains. How do, so, and how did Colorado Springs fit into this mix again? And Colorado Springs was my job, initial first brewing job with Bristol Brewing. Okay, well, let's go ahead and get into that then. So how did, yeah. how did Bristol... Uh, start for you well for me um i went to high school with mike bristol who's the founder and still current owner running uh, bristol brewing so he was uh, a home brewer and he was raising money from friends and family to build this brewery okay this is 1994 i guess that's pretty early in the brewing game the I early think. stages yeah. you know i think he saw what odell doug odell had done in uh, Fort Collins. When did they start? Were they... they started in uh, 1989, I believe. Okay. So he kind of saw what was happening there and saw the opportunity in Colorado Springs, chose Colorado Springs. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think Doug um, kind of mentored Mike and helped him get his brewery put together. And so that was 1995, and I was um, a small investor. Okay. With Mike, right from the start. But then you started working there. Yeah, after a couple months, Mike was growing at a, uh, enough rapid pace. He needed a brewer. Okay. He was more into the sales and the office work. Even though he was a home brewer to start, but yeah. he didn't want to. He didn't. No, he didn't do too much brewing. He got it all started. Okay. And he's kind of a, he's a mechanical engineer. Was his schooling? So I think he was really into building it. Uh huh. And and then just managing it. Okay. And he certainly would get his. He would write the recipes, and you know he'd get his hands into the mechanics. But the day to day operations, he was that, running the business. Okay. So you end up being the brewer there, and and had you been like a home brewer? Had no, you, not at all. You were just no, a fan. I was a connoisseur. <laughs> I was very much a connoisseur. Uh huh. And um, so I just learned on the job. My first batch was, you know, 600 gallons. Wow. And, you know, it didn't take long to train me. Huh. So, okay. So what, let's just go ahead and start then. So tell us about the brewing process from start to finish for people who have never taken a beer tour or something, brewery tour. Well, I guess you start with um, malted barley. 
and you'll you'll crack that barley through a mill. Okay, because it's it's basically when you say crack, it's like got a yeah. little seed, basically. Yeah, the barley when you malt barley, you basically um, soak it and keep it at a temperature, and you allow that seed, barley seed, to start to germinate. Okay. And then you cut off that process, so it builds a starch inside the seed. Okay. And then you dry it out. And then when the conversion, when you mix water with this cracked um, starch, it turns to a sugar, a glucose. Okay. Sugar. Um, so um, you can also toast or roast this barley to get your different um, flavors, whether it's a stout or a red ale. Okay. So you'll do this mash with the barley, create this sweet liquid called wort. Okay. And then you'll boil that liquid and add hops at different stages. And the hops is basically your spice. Okay. And you'll add that during the boil. Different types of hops that give different flavors and aromas, as well as the timing, how long you boil them. So you know, I do a, about a 90 minute boil and after this boil, we'll run it through a heat exchanger, and I'll just use um, water, city water, and cool the wort from boiling, which at this altitude is about 198 degrees. Okay. And I'll cool it down to um, anywhere from 65 Fahrenheit to 52 Fahrenheit, depending on what uh, the type of beer is and what type of yeast I'm using. Okay. And so at this point, I'll uh, pump that cooled wort into one of my fermentation tanks and um, pitch my liquid yeast, um, whether it's an ale, which is around 66 degrees, and, um, or a lager, which is around 52. All right. And then, then where does that go from there? So it'll sit in the fermentation tank, which are um, temperature controlled. And it'll sit and ferment for anywhere from, let's say, five to ten days. Yeah. And that's when this yeast eats all the sugar, produces carbon dioxide and alcohol, or the byproducts. Okay. So after seven to ten days, most of that um, sugar has been consumed by your yeast. And at this point, I'll chill that beer um, I'll cool it down, which will cause the yeast to go dormant. Okay. And fall to the bottom of the tank. Yep. And then I'll collect this yeast and reuse it for subsequent batches. Yep. And then at that point, I'll keep, um, depending on the beer, I can add more hops to it, which is called dry hopping. All right. Which uh, okay. is really popular with IPAs, pale ales. Um, gives you a lot of that aroma hop aroma in a beer. Um, so I'll keep these beers chilled anywhere from 32 to 40 degrees for you know the ales for another week or so and the lagers you know we try to go three to four weeks at that cold temperature which just allows the beer to mature condition. When you say mature how, how so it's just like the Flavors are kind of like... Yeah, the flavors, they're a little harsh in the beginning. Okay. So the yeast, even though it's most mostly dormant, it's still kind of cleaning up some of those um, off flavors. So, you know, you think about a wine, conditioning a wine. Okay. The beer is just a little bit quicker. Okay. You know. Okay. And after that, um, after it's done in the fermentation tank and conditioning, I'll transfer it over to what's called a bright beer tank. And that's where I will finish off the carbonation to make the carbonation level Uh where I want it. Yep. And chill it down to 32 degrees, and from there it's ready for a package, whether it's a keg or Mm -hmm. potentially canning or bottling. Got it. That's the process. That's the process. So So it takes about, you know, 10 days to a month, depending on the beer. Okay. Start, start to, finish. to finish. Yeah. 
so you learned all this at Bristol in Colorado Springs, and how long how long did you stay there then? You know, I worked from ninety, I guess ninety four till ninety nine. Okay. And we moved to a new facility in ninety seven, built that up, started bottling, and you know, I just found myself working in Colorado Springs and living in the mountains. Right. Every spare moment I had, I was up in the You're out of there. somewhere. Uh huh. So I came to the realization that I need to move the mountains. Okay. So that's when I pretty much moved to Crested Butte. Okay. Right around 2000. Right around 2000. Yeah. But you didn't stay here forever. You moved on. Let's talk about that a little bit. Yeah. You know, I, I, I built a house here and started a family in 2000, early 2000s. And then had an opportunity to go up to British Columbia. My wife's Canadian. Right. And she had fallen in love with this little ski town called Rosland. And we had bought a house up there. And decided, you know, it, it was a good time to maybe go check out Canada. Yeah, for sure. 2006. No, Heard a lot of good things. Yeah. Had traveled there. Hadn't skied much there myself. Um... So we ended up moving up there and Yeah, for anyone who doesn't know, I, I also lived in Roslyn for the winter of 2000, 2001, so just a few months. Nice. But um, I've always told people it's the Crested Butte doppelganger, right? Because they've got a Paradise Lift and a Paradise Bowl and a Paradise Warming House. Yeah, very similar. And a Rafters, which we don't have anymore, but we used to. <laughs> um, yeah, super cool town up there. So yeah, quality town, quality people, quality yeah. recreation. Yeah, yeah, you know, and um, I'd say a lot less busy. Oh, I'm than sure. Colorado, yeah, Crested Butte. Yeah. So you know, there's some good things. Sure. Um, I miss it, but um, you know, Crested Butte has a lot going for it in itself. For sure. And I got involved in this, the Irwin Brewing project. Yeah. Yeah, and we'll jump to that in a minute. When, when you were up there, though, you kept brewing, but at this point, you're a home brewer. That's right. I was up. I was up in Canada, and I was getting frustrated with the uh, the price of the beer. Yeah, it's all states. Well yeah, it's all state the, liquor stores um, there, and yeah, it's the variety. You know, I think it's the taxes. They tax alcohol a little more than the U.S. Right. So that's passed on the consumer, um, and just. Canada was a little behind the times in the craft brewing. Sure. And so I decided I'd better start brewing my own beer. Right. And so I had done a very little bit of home brewing uh, while we, we did some test brewing at Bristol, but not too much. Uh-huh. Um, so I had our test system from Bristol, brought it up to Rosalind and started brewing in my basement. Right. And a lot of my friends were just kept asking me, when are you going to open the brewery in Rosalind? Yeah. Because Rosalind did not have one. It does now? Or does it still um, It does now, yes. Okay. And a couple guys, a couple home brewers started okay. up a small brewery. Okay. So um, when you were doing that, were you finding that you had, like, was it easier to play around because you're only brewing these little batches? So, oh, it like, was a lot you... of fun. Because at Bristol, you know, we started with two brands. Um, you know, I think we had maybe four or five brands when I left Bristol. And yeah, home brewing, there's just so much playing around you can do, exactly. Yeah. And it's only 10 gallons. Right, so if you screw it up, that's a bummer and you... Well, yeah, you're just giving it away to your friends. <laughs> right, <laughs> you're like, this one wasn't quite what I you thought it was going to be, but... You don't have 30 kegs maybe you... sitting around. Yeah, yeah. So, and I think that's kind of where the craft brewing industry is really evolve from home brewers and because now you can't get by with five brands you have to have a big variety and you have right. to have it changing all the time right right so i mean at bristol we tried to make an ipa in like 1996 and we could not sell it yeah it just would not sell <laughs> we're gonna get to ipas in a <laughs> bit but <laughs> that's interesting that you say that for sure for sure. So, well, let's take a real quick break, and then we'll get back to um, Irwin Brewing in just a sec.
in the Crested Butte Real Estate Minute. I am recording this in mid-June of 2018, and we have had 259 sales, totaling $112 million in the Crested Butte and Gunnison area so far. If I compare that to the same time period in 2017, it was 271 sales and $121 million. So fairly similar. I would say the big difference is just uh, the inventory. It is harder to find uh, properties in certain price ranges. So for buyers, um, you know, you just have to be ready and willing and, and uh, be aggressive when you see a property that you like. For sellers, uh, right now is uh, certainly a great time to sell. So if you have any questions about buying or selling real estate, my name is Frank Consella. My website is CrestedButteRealEstateAgent.com, and you can look me up there. My contact info is there, and I'd love to talk to you. And let's get back to talking about beer. So we are back, and now you're back in Crested Butte, and you're at Irwin. So tell us how you got involved with Irwin Brewing. Yeah, so I was... I hadn't been back much after moving to Canada. Um, we came back, I came back to put some stain on our house that, we, that I had built in, back in 2002. Yeah. And we were back here for, I guess, uh, two to three weeks. And, you know, just seeing lots of our old friends. And then I heard about um, these guys building, just starting to build this brewery here in town. Yeah. And um, rumor has had it that they didn't have a brewer or, and they also needed some consulting. Okay. So um, I ended up talking to the uh, owner's representative who was uh, in charge of the building of the brewery and um, had a meeting and pretty much started consulting right there from day one. As far as like how they should build it, what, they need, what equipment they needed, yeah, all know, that they kind had, of stuff. They had blueprints for the building. And it's a multi-use building. They have offices, um, a conference room, as well as the brewery. Sure. And so, you know, there wasn't much that was going to change on the footprint or just the layout. But, um, you know, I was able to get in and um, spec all the equipment and design where it was going to be on the footprint of the floor space. Which has to be nice because it was what you wanted it to be. You kind of had an idea of what works and what doesn't, having been around the industry. Yeah, working with all the plumbers right from the start, all the electricians, figuring out where I wanted my power, um, where I wanted all my plumbing. Yeah. And um, again, specking all the equipment, working with them just to get the best quality, most efficient um, equipment system built. And it is an amazing brewery to work in. Yeah, no, we're, we're we're recording this in it, and it's uh it's awesome to see see what's in here. You know, I've so. got a lot of natural light, you know, floor to ceiling windows. Yeah, which you go into a lot of breweries, and they are <laughs> in basements or just sure. in big warehouses. Um, you know, I've got tile, white tile, which also keeps it very light. Yeah, and no, I've it's got a- some some really good um, mechanical systems. And air exchange. So I've got louvers with fans I can open up and run on and off during the day to just keep the air clean. We've got really clean, fresh air nice. to work in, which is which is great. Don't have to breathe yeah. breathe brew brewery smells all day. There's a lot of steam, <laughs> there's a lot of chemicals. Yeah. There's, there's certain smells. Most are good. I yeah. like the smell of beer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So when uh, when did the first uh, beer start start being released? Yeah, so I moved back down from British Columbia, I guess, um, late 2015. The building was probably up and dried in, but still a long way to go. So I was doing a lot of home brewing uh-huh. again here, testing batches, you know, giving it to the owners, giving it to all the workers and around town, getting feedback. Sure. Um, I think we we brewed the first beer in uh, November 2016. Okay. And so we were selling beer January 1st, 2017, officially. Okay. So, all around town. Yep. Yep. Well, I can. I, I will tell you. I remember the first one I had. It was the stout. Okay. 
And uh, I feel like a stout is a good um, tester because I've had a lot of really bad craft sure. stouts. They tend to be really flat sometimes and kind of high alcohol y, and they shouldn't be because the Guinness is easy drinking, honestly, even though sure. it's dark. And that's and how it should be. And that's how I feel like your stouts, you can drink it. Yeah, it's my not... stouts, middle of the road. It's probably 6% alcohol. Um, I actually had won a silver medal at the Great American Beer Festival at Bristol awesome. with their oatmeal stout. Yeah. And so, you know, I modeled mine similar to that beer. Uh huh. Although they would probably taste completely different. Um, but we also served that stout on a nitrogen um, Guinness faucet. Uh huh. That select accounts. And that's, that's absolutely huge. delicious. Oh, yeah. No, and that's pretty huge. Head. Yeah. That's a huge thing. Well, let's just get into the styles a little bit. And I'm just going to go ahead and throw it out there. No okay. one's going to agree with me, but I hate IPAs. Yeah. And the, re- the reason I... Well, okay, I don't love drinking them for one, but I also feel like there used to be a little bit more variety back when um, people weren't so IPA obsessed. Um, like, for instance, Bristol, I'd, I'd be hard-pressed to find a Laughing Lab Scottish Ale anywhere because people don't carry Scottish Ales because those don't sell like an IPA. So what, what's your feeling on the IPA craze? Um, yeah, there's so many new styles of IPA that keep popping up. Yeah. Um, you got your session. You know, I, brew a, I brew a red IPA. Just I did a few batches. A double IPA. Yeah. They're putting fruit in IPAs. And yeah. Spices. What is there? A white IPA, which is doubles and imperials and so triples. And <laughs> you, you call a beer IPA anything, and it's and it's selling. So you know, part of the business. Yeah. Is selling beer. But is it? Do you love IPAs as well? So are you happy about that trend, or do you wish that there was um, more? You more? know. I, my variety of beer taste, it's kind of by mood and kind of what kind of food I might be eating. Sure, no. What, I, yeah. what kind of recreation, the temperature. Yeah. So, you know, it really just changes day to day. Yeah, or hour for sure. to hour. Um, I do enjoy a good IPA. Um, I do like hops, but yeah. I, I think I find myself drinking as much or more Pilsner these days and I actually think the, the craft beer consumer I think they are shying away a little bit from the hops and yeah you think it's gonna, the pendulum's going to swing back maybe? I think it is I think the alcohol content is also going to subside a little bit yeah yeah that's another thing I've noticed there's a lot of times I'm like oh jeez I was going to have a second but maybe not yeah <laughs> especially at this altitude you know yeah. most of the beer I make is very sessionable. You can have a couple pints, yeah, and just not feel like you're slammed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we have an English brown ale that you know that one's really good. S- similar to that Scottish ale, Laughing Lab, easy drinking. Yeah. You know, a lot of people like that, and you know, my main go-to would be an American pale ale. Yeah. It's kind of you know, it's just the subdued version of an IPA. Right, yeah. So I make one of those. I really like that. Yeah, it's a bit more balanced, I'd say, as well. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you my favorite uh, beer would actually, I don't know if you've had this. Have you ever had the, I don't know how to pronounce it, it's Hammer Dunkelweiss? Oh. You ever had a Dunkelweiss? Um, I've had Dunkelweiss. That's my favorite beer style. I'm not familiar with that one. Do do me a favor and do do a a Dunkelweiss someday. Okay. Well, I do have a couple um, collaboration brews with a couple Denver breweries coming up okay and one of them um looks to be a german real um traditional german hefeweizen uh-huh so you know, yeah i could what distincts that beer is the yeast you're using right so i could potentially make a dunkel bites and with yeah. that yeast and you reuse it that would be pretty cool so i'll think about that <laughs> i appreciate that <laughs> so yeah that beer is going to be made with bierstadt which is in Denver. I'm not sure what street they're on, but downtown. Um, very traditional German brewer. Very, you know, he's educated. Um, very well renowned. So I'm looking forward to working with him. Is that a pretty common thing in the brewery business that people do oh, these collaborations yeah, and things? Yeah, it's very. It's it's getting really popular. Yeah. Just working with your um, fraternity 
yeah and getting to know people and you know and you learn a lot just talking and, and actually brewing with another brewer yeah um, yeah the other one is with Jagged Mountain um, another Denver brewery and you know I met these guys at a uh, beer festival and they talked about how they love Crested Butte and want to come up here it's an excuse for them to come visit right <laughs> right a little vacation yeah so we're going to brew, you know, they, they have some Saison yeast that they use. Um, I've homebrewed some Saisons, and um, so we're going to figure out some kind of Saison. Wow, Talk fun. about throwing some spruce tips, some local, go and picking some there you go. local spruce and spicing it with that. Wow, So fun. look for that um, probably before July. Okay. Yeah, those are going to be two new brews for the summer. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Um, uh, yeah, that was another question I was going to ask. What, what, anything else you're working on that you care to share right now? Or? Well, you know, we have a little 10-gallon um, pilot system, and my assistant um, has been playing around with that and doing some home brewing. Yeah. And he's been experimenting with some kettle souring. You know, that's kind of the rage, having that's, some sour that's beer. An, that's another popular thing so you know we could probably do that um right now i think once the summer season hits we kind of get slammed and we've got enough um varieties with these two new ones that uh we'd probably look to add something in the fall right yeah so you might see something in the fall maybe an october fest or something given the season yeah maybe cool what um so what are the future plans for Irwin Brewing? Where, where, where are the next steps? Well, right now we're just, um, you know, we're growing organically. We're distributing, um, self-distributing um, everywhere between Aspen and Telluride. So we have a pretty good presence in Aspen, both in Aspen and Telluride. Um, Ure, they love our beer, and that place just crushes it in the summer. It's amazing. Um, Ridgeway. Montrose, we're just starting to get into Grand Junction. Okay. So hopefully we, um, you know, we find some more. We have, we're in sub, all these seasonal markets. So the month of April, May, it's just amazing how slow business Even, gets. Because all the, all the places you're at are Half all... the restaurants are closed. Right, right. So, um, you know, we're going to continue to push these markets. There's a lot to do even here in Crested Butte and Gunnison. We have a long ways to go. Yeah, there's a lot of a lot of restaurants that are, aren't carrying it currently. So, um, And we're also looking at, um, we've already got our can labels approved, and so we're looking to buy a small canning line and looking for canning, you know, definitely before 2019. Nice. So, and you think that'll just mostly be months. Guns and Crested Butte, or is that going to go all no, we'll, over? No, we'll can everywhere we're distributing, for sure. Okay. I'll distribute cans as well. Nice. So that should pick up some of the off-season doldrums as well. Yeah. Because people people get out of town, and then maybe they'll take a case of beer with them. When they sure. Go, when for they sure. Yeah. For sure. So um, kind of finish it off, and let's talk about um, beer brewing across the world right now um i was in colombia of all places a year ago and i was really surprised to see craft brews there i was expecting just your typical yellow beer like you find in most of the world have you have you done much traveling and seen how how it's growing yeah, like you know, everywhere I, globally um, i guess it was two years ago i went to um norway and um had a stopover in london and I saw Odell on tap in London. Really? Wow. Left hand, Ska, Stone, you know, and most of them were IPA. Sure. It's amazing. Yeah. So, you know, like I said, 20 years ago, we couldn't sell an IPA. Now the whole world wants IPA. Um, my brother's in Japan. I was just talking to him last week. He said there's craft breweries popping up in Japan. A lot of the brewers are from uh, the U.S., but they're still not. The, the public over there is still at such a small niche. Right. But he said there's a lot of talk about it. Yeah, yeah, but, no, and that's what's, 
like I said, like with what I just mentioned, I was so surprised to see see this thing growing and and. Uh, Sure. You nice. go anywhere in the world, and you'll probably find some American-influenced craft beer. Yeah, if you look hard enough. Going. Yeah, yeah. So, um, start to finish it up here. But Crested Butte is home for you. Why? Why do you choose to make this your home? Yeah, you know, I love the mountains, and I grew up, like I said, grew up skiing, and I couldn't get enough of it after college. And once I moved here, I just like the small town. I like the community. I like the accountability of living in a small town, <laughs> seeing familiar faces every day. Yeah. I don't like traffic, stoplights. <laughs> and I mean, once you, once you give it a go and once you live in a small town, a mountain town, you know, I can't think of, imagine living in a city again. It'd be real hard to keep the skiing thing going, but move to Salt Lake at this point, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> um, I do miss Canada. I see myself possibly retiring up in Canada. Yeah. 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 In Roslyn still? Roslyn. Yeah. I have lifelong friends there. Yeah. After living there 10 years. Um, like I do in Crested Butte. Once you live in a small place. Yeah. You know everybody. You're always a part of that. Um, so yeah, you know, Crested Butte is a cold environment. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> and sometimes, the not this I last get, winter. <laughs> yeah. The older I get, the, the more the cold it just gets down into your bones. So <laughs> that's funny. I, I, I have the the problem with the heat. I'm like, I'm oh. like, oh man, it's upper seventies. I got a, oh no. Yeah, it's, I don't mind heat. I've yeah, the heat I just crushes a lot of me. Construction work in the Caribbean uh, all throughout got, my twenties. Somehow you got used to it. And uh, yeah, I can deal with heat. Yeah, but you know, Rosalind, you can grow vegetables. You can have gardens. There's apple trees and plum trees. Yeah, yeah, no, it's uh, you know, I like kind of that true summer. Yeah, they do have um, that. One um, thing I like about Crested Butte is the schools. So I have a couple children, and the school here is just top notch. It is teachers. It is, and so that's another thing that really brought me back. Um, you know, I do everything for my kids, and to get them in a good environment, a good school environment is important. As well yeah. as be closer yeah. to my uh, mother and father in Fort Collins. Right. right. So that's Crested Butte. That's what I love about it. There you go. Good answer. Uh, where can people learn more about you and Erwin Brewing? Learn more? Yeah. Uh, What's your website? Got, uh, we've got <laughs> Erwin Brewing um, Company dot com website. Um, look it up. We've got some Facebook out there. You can see events where, you know, we hit the summer festival season pretty much on the western slope. We don't do much on the front range. Okay. Um, yet, you know, we'll get to Denver, but that's a whole nother market to be prepared for. So it would actually be easier for us to deliver beer to Denver right now than all the way to Aspen. Okay. In the winter. It's the same amount of time. Yeah. <laughs> but Denver is just such a, such a big market. Yeah. Um, you got to go in there with a big plan. But we'll get there. I would say, you know, 2019, we might be looking at the front do. range. Yeah. Nice. But check us out at festivals. You know, we'll be at Snowmass. I'll be in Keystone. There's a great one, Bluegrass and uh, Bruce. We won the best brewery last year. So I'm really looking forward to that one. So that's like your whole lineup won the best? Like yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, I had two or three beers going. Okay. But it was voters' choice, people's choice. Nice. Um, so that was nice. cool. Congrats. Um, and in Durango in August, Montrose coming up this weekend. Nice. Um, anything else I should have asked you about that I forgot about or didn't know about? Um, no, I think we hit it pretty good. <laughs> okay. Um, come visit if you come to Crested Butte. Um, you know, we don't have a tap house at the brewery. We do sell growlers to go. Um if I'm in here, I will usually not turn anyone away to fill a growler up. Our hours officially are right now just weekends. Okay. Fridays and Saturdays. Um, and then we do have um, a little affiliation with a restaurant called The Public House. And they have all of my beers on tap. They've got some cask ale that I make, you know, real traditional English style. Um, so check it out. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. And... Uh... Good luck with everything. Cool. Thanks, Frank. All right.